Yes, uh, very nice to be back in your office, Mr. Kruger. You're more than welcome. Uh, we never had time to talk about uh, your uh, book last time I was here. And uh, I have now had time to look through it a little bit. And uh, first of all, I must uh, ask you, why, why did you decide to write this book that is named uh, Settlement of the Boer Afrikaner People's Claim to Territorial Self-Determination, Inviting International Intervention? Yes, as um, I explained last time, the Volksrat, which is the um, body of representatives who um, voted into um, a position of representativity for the people by uh, an election facilitated by the VVK. The Volksrat went through all the peaceful remedies. Uh, they exhausted all the peaceful remedies firstly within South Africa for our people to uh, reattain a situation of constitutional self-determination. When all those internal remedies um, were exhausted and we still did not retain the position of self-determination which we seek then only outstanding issue which remained was for the Volksrat to follow the international remedies, uh, to exhaust the international remedies. Now, when the uh, Volksrat exhausted the, international, the, the internal remedies, the national remedies, there was still the international community who had to be, who had to be provided with an opportunity to uh, mediate in this situation. But our situation was, uh, is absolutely contaminated by years and years of propaganda against the Boer people, bad propaganda against the Boer people. Uh, untrue propaganda. So the international community lacks the information on the table. Exactly. We uh, could not expect the international community to take an informed decision on getting involved with only the biased information and propaganda which is typical of uh, the international view on our people. And then the Volksrat uh, gave me the assignment to prepare a written document which we could provide the international community with and which put our situation in the correct perspective, firstly, from a historical point of view, secondly, outlining everything which the Volksrat had been doing since its inception uh, by exhausting its national remedies and also outlining to the international community the transgressions of the ANC in terms of international law. Why do we say the, the ANC government in South Africa transgress international law uh, and why do we expect the international community to mediate in the situation uh, with a view to territorial self-determination. So it is a whole mouthful of information which had to be provided and it evolved over time into the, the book which you've mentioned. Yeah, because it's a massive piece of work and I'm really impressed uh, reading it of uh, how thoroughly you have gone through the material and you're laying it uh, forward in a very, very pedagogical way. But uh, one of the biggest uh, discussion now here in South Africa is the concern of land. And uh, in the political discourse, uh, mostly from Julius Malema, is the claim that the original sin was that you stole the land. Yeah. And uh, how do you counter that in, uh, in the book? In the book, it's been countered by setting out the correct historical position. Firstly, by um, pointing out that 
South Africa was never a country colonized by the Netherlands, as is the general idea uh, in many quarters. South, South Africa as a country didn't even exist when White set foot here in 1652. Only Cape Town and surrounds were, was chosen as a place where a private company in the Netherlands, namely the Vier Oersier, the Verenigde Oers Indische Compagnie, would uh, plant, uh, would grow crops and um, have animals to provide the ships uh, which uh, have been taking part into, in the uh, uh, many travels to the, to the east from Europe. So these ships uh, were in need of fresh um, food and fresh water and uh, in need of um, uh, the, the, the crews of the ships were in need of medical attention many times. And the, only the Cape and surrounds, Cape Town and surrounds, or what later evolved into Cape Town and surrounds, were basically earmarked for a piece of land where they could um, have this agriculture, mainly agricultural activities. The fear was seer never took land from indigenous people in the Cape because the indigenous peoples which they came across were firstly nomads. They trekked around from place to place. They were never permanently fixed into permanently fixed structures. And uh, these nomads, uh, do they uh, have a part in the modern day South Africa? Is it uh, they, the blacks we see here today in South Africa? Is it the descendants of these nomads? Not the blacks. Uh, we have a, 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 a part of the population in South Africa called uh, the, the coloreds or the brown people and uh, there are traces of the true indigenous uh, people of South Africa, uh, Southern Africa, which is uh, the, uh, known by the scientific name of the Khoisan, and they contain elements of the Khoisan, but not only the Khoisan, there's other liaisons as well, which contributed to the population of the colored people. So, so you do a separation uh against blacks and the, the nomads that were because I think that's weird in a Swedish perspective uh, weren't the nomads blacks as well? The blacks um, also trekked around a lot but they were a little bit more um, stable in terms of the um, uh, the patterns in which they organized themselves so they they had uh, uh, kraals, which we the Afrikaans word is kraals, in other words uh, villages, which was built basically from elementary elements, uh, nature elements like grass and dung, and they settled a little bit more permanently into these kraals than the Khoisan. The Khoisan really moved around only living under pieces of skin basically. Um, or in caves. And uh, at which point in history did the white man encounter these more uh, tribal blacks that had some sort of uh, society structure? They were encountered only in 1770 to 1775. In other words, much more than a century after Van der Riebeek set foot in, Cape Town, in, in what later became Cape Town, were they encountered at the um, surrounds of the Fish River and, uh, and that is about 800 kilometers yeah. from from the Cape from Cape Town so we didn't encounter the blacks for, for, for more than a century after we set foot here that's the first thing the second thing is after we did encounter the blacks we uh, went out of our way to live in peaceful coexistence with them and to barter land from them and to only occupy land which was left um, vacant by them 
and the internal s- struggles, so like the different one. So it was a negotiation amongst the Boers and the black tribes for purchasing the land. Correct. There were many instances of land being bartered and land being um, uh, negotiated for Boer settlement. And uh, why is it that today that these treatments with the black tribes are not acknowledged? Yeah, that is a good question uh, because the blacks uh, pronounce uh, or extend the allegation that the, the land has been stolen, but this runs contrary to their own history because it's not only part of Boer history the land that was negotiated from the blacks it also forms part of the black history but it obviously doesn't suit them today and that's why they're going back on that now Um, but huge tracts of the southern african interior was obtained uh, were obtained in that way and other tracts of 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 land was uh, had been um, occupied by the boers since it was vacant because the blacks had many wars amongst themselves in the uh, as from the 1820s onwards in which they uh, in which many of the black peoples were exterminated actually and uh, they left behind them vast tracts of land which were which was full of ruins and and death bones so the boer settled there because there was really no one there um, in this combination of land being negotiated and empty land, terra nullius, as it were, being occupied by the by the Boers, uh, makes a complete fallacy of the idea of land being stolen from the blacks. We never ever went into a region and claimed, simply claimed land or killed people off the land in order to usurp that land. That is not part of Boer culture. That has never been part of Boer history. That's not the way Boers do things. Yeah, because this separates quite uh, much from other Westerners uh, going out into the free world of uh, America or Australia. That's the ironic part. The Australians and the Americans uh, and the Canadians who were in the forefront of pointing fingers at us during apartheid obtained land by killing off the indigenous peoples there. They almost didn't have any people to commit apartheid towards because by the time we applied a policy of apartheid towards the black peoples here they have all all but exterminated their own. So that's why my contention is that we will never get anywhere by the pointing of fingers. No one on earth can point fingers at other people and their history. No one has got a clean slate. Least of all, the Americans, the Australians, the Canadians, the New Zealanders, those people who are so much in the forefront of attacking South Africa. So we have a tradition as the Boer people of living in peace. We always strove to live in peace with our neighbors, but we also want to be left alone in peace. We don't want to be enslaved by other people just as, as little as anyone wants to be enslaved by others. Uh, But we we are a very peace-loving people and we are a people that shied away from bloodshedding whenever we could. That's why all the wars that we have fought in our history started off as defensive wars. Each and every one of them started off as a war in which we defended our, ourselves, our women and our children and in which we had to fight for our, for our bare existence. Um, uh, and uh, if we take history, uh, history and uh, place it in uh, present time and look at the discourse now, I, I think it's quite interesting your past in two aspects. 
The first that the left doesn't acknowledge this treatise almost is uh, racist in itself because that pretty much means that the black tribes are minors, not uh, grown enough to engage in these kind of negotiations over land. Yeah. And, the, and the other thing that uh, struck me as a uh, foreigner from Europe, where it's no doubt was the native uh, people, which is uh, white Europeans in Sweden, the discourse uh, in present time politics is that uh, all the development that we have uh, in Sweden comes from overseas. It uh, <laughs> comes from immigration and uh, that our own history is just barbarism. And uh, I, it ca I can't help uh, question why isn't that discourse done here? Why don't the South African politicians say the same thing as Swedish politicians that the South African history was just barbarism before the immigrants come here and gave us civilization. Exactly. Because that it, it, it almost looks that it would be more true here than it is uh, in my country. Well, that is, that is accepted historic fact. Before the, the whites settled into this country, centuries ago, there was nothing here. Absolutely nothing. Every single piece of development, every single trace of technology, every single uh, piece of infrastructure which you see here is the initiative of white and the ingenuity of whites. And there are many blacks who fortunately acknowledge that. They obviously are not quoted very much in the, main, in the mainstream media, but you have blacks who readily acknowledge that. We have the... Fortunately, we don't have to rely on our own so-called bias, biased sources to tell people how it was in Southern Africa before we arrived here. We have the um, uh, stories, uh, written, the, the written histories of people who were very antagonistic, antagonistic towards the Boers. Like, for example, the British missionary uh, Robert Moffat. He went into the South African interior prior to the Great Trek in the 1820s. He settled in what became Transvaal afterwards or, or, and the Northern Cape. And he had many travels through what later became the Transvaal. He described how it had been the, the, the situation when he, uh, about 10 years before the Boers arrived here. He said that his wagons trod, uh, passed miles and miles of open territory where there were just skeletons lying around, where there were just ruins, where once uh, huge uh, communities lived, that there was nothing left after the Matabili, the endeavors of Nzilikazi went through here. It's not we, it's not us who make that claim. Robert Moffat, as a very anti-Boer person who hated the Boers, he makes the acknowledgement that these people were absolute savages. And he, he described his um, and we're not talking about even now the 1700s, we're talking about 1830, 1832. That is just the other day. Then he arrived at uh, Mtsilikatsi's kraal with his wagons and he describes how Mtsilikatsi is absolutely flabbergasted by his wagon and the wheels of this wagon. Complete savages who, who didn't know a thing who didn't know as, uh, to set a sail on a boat, who didn't know the wheel. I'm not even talking about reading and writing. This is what a liberal English missionary says, said. And uh, during this time, you're covering it uh, very thoroughly, uh, you established several Boer Republic states in this negotiation with the black tribes. And uh, I think we can just fast forward a little bit to after the Anglo-Boer War, because you got invaded by... Uh, Britain, because of reasons, uh, one of the, them would be mining the, the yeah. gold. And uh, after that war, the Boer Republic 
together with all the black tribe territory established the present day South Africa geographically at least. Yeah, so South Africa as a as a state entity as we know it is a very recent development. In 1910 after the Boer republics were usurped by the British Empire, as you say, due to uh, not only the minerals which were detected here, but also the power struggle which uh, evolved. I mean, it's it's known fact that the British didn't uh, tolerate any power except their own during the 1800s and the early 1900s. So they just had to usurp and and annex and colonize wherever there had been a shred of tele technological advance and economic development. They had to have it for themselves. That's why they uh, eventually crushed the Boer Republics and after they crushed the Boer Republics by way of genocide amongst each other, amongst others, uh, see, a couple of years afterwards, in 1910, they created the state of the Union of South Africa by unionizing not only the former Boer republics, which they've crushed by then, but also the, the two southern colonies, which uh, had been run as British colonies, the Capesons on a permanent basis since 1806, and Natal, which they've also taken from the Boers, since 1842 about. So it is firstly a British uh, creation. South Africa, as we know it today, is a British creation. It was a creation of a state in, a, in the British Empire. It came about due to British military dominance and British political dominance. It is a artificial creation of peoples, several peoples, strewn over a whole subcontinent who do not belong with each other into one country. They're just too different. Yeah, it's quite interesting because uh, when people look at the African map, they uh, used to say that lots of the tribal wars in Africa is because uh, the geographical borders has been drawn on the map. So the borders has, have divided different tribes. But, exactly. But then you it, get people of the same tribe uh, on both sides of the of a border. Yeah, but but in your case, it's the opposite. With this new redrawn border after the end of World War, you got all these tribes together inside the same border. It's in the sense of the opposite, and in the sense the same old story. Because so take for example the northwestern border of South Africa also divides the Chwana people. So you had a, a couple of Chwanas in South, South inside South Africa, even today, and the other Chwanas stay in, in a place called Botswana. Mm. So they separated, it's the same people, exactly the same people, same culture, but they separated by an uh, a border artificially drawn by the, by the British. Yeah. And uh, if I understood uh, your book correctly here, one, one of the apartheid uh, governments were to solve this issue by dividing the land to the different tribes. Yes, Grand Apartheid was a, uh, an endeavor to give la to, to, to return the original land, tribal lands, in the full sense of the word, also in terms of full political sovereignty, to return that land back to the peoples who inhabited those lands. And in drawing the apartheid's uh, homeland ter uh, borders, the so-called Bantustan borders, as it was called uh, outside the country, scorningly, the apartheid government went out of its way to get the same people within the same borders and not to duplicate the mistake which the European colonialist powers made. So those, those uh, borders were drawn in such a way as to give everyone their due. The borders of KwaZulu was drawn in such a way so as not to include Swanos, because 
the Zulus and Tswanas did not live amongst each other in the first instance. The borders of KwaZulu was, had been drawn where the Zulus lived. The borders of Bubut and Tswana were drawn where the Tswanas lived. And same, the same with all the other black tribes. So the present-day South African government uh, granted all these black tribes their own homeland based on uh, their ethnicity or... That the apartheid government granted them their homelands. But the interesting part is this. The ANC, during their so-called years of struggle, was vehemently opposed towards the so-called Bantustans. They downplayed and ridiculed the so-called Bantustans wherever they could as a grand apartheid scheme and as something which is basically purely out of hell. But the interesting thing is, what did the ANC do when they came into power in 1994? Did they disband the Bantustans? No, they never did that. They keep the Bantustans intact. They are not called by different names any longer, maybe. Like KwaZulu or Botswana or Siske or Transke. But in practical terms, me and you as white people can, as of today, still not own a square millimeter piece of property in those countries. It's still reserved for the blacks. Up till today, they've got their own legal systems there. They've got their own cultural systems there going. It's pretty much a system of a state within a state as it had been during apartheid. And the funny thing is, the United Nations was so opposed against that during the apartheid government's times. But nowadays they tolerate it from the ANC. The most that the United Nations would do is to point out to the ANC that this is actually uh, not acceptable to have different systems within a country, like different legal systems uh, some people being uh, subjected to a, another legal system than other people in the same country. Some people being allowed to stay in a certain a piece on a certain piece of land in a country, but other people not, purely based on the color of their skin. But that's where it stays. They don't impose sanctions against the ANC due to that. Yeah. And uh, why, why do you think that the uh, apartheid government uh, were so demonized uh, by this live and let live uh, policy? Because the anti-apartheid struggle was never about the injustice or the so-called injustice towards blacks. The anti-apartheid struggle had one basis only. And that is to get rid of the white government. To destroy the Western civilized governmental system in place in Southern Africa. And to get it replaced by a black dominated barbarian system like we have now. Where anarchy reigns, where communism and socialism is the new trends and where whites have to flee in order to stay alive. Just like it was in all other places, in many other parts of the world and just like it is starting to become in Europe itself now. The, the anti-apartheid struggle was rooted in hate towards whites, not love towards blacks. Yeah. And uh, in that context, one can really understand why the real history, the history of facts, doesn't really matter that much. Exactly. And um, you also uh, takes up some statistics in your book, uh, uh, some studies regarding uh, how much uh, money that was transferred from the South African government into these uh, tribal homelands. Yes, to understand apartheid, one must first understand the rationale behind apartheid. The rationale was 
and the Boers reasoned like that. We cannot expect the blacks suddenly, all of a sudden, to be able to fend for themselves in their own territories again. They've been intermingling with us now for, for centuries and they have a certain type of dependency on us for jobs and for literacy and for many things. And we cannot, we, we have a moral obligation and it will also be from a practical point of view, be unwise just to shove them off in some sort of far-flung corner and expect them to survive. So the idea was to develop them, to bring their development up to a certain standard where they themselves could be able to sustain themselves in their own territories. And that's why successive apartheid governments spend so much, for example, on black education. Black education was one of the biggest items on the apartheid government's uh, uh, budget lists throughout its existence, and especially since Dr. Favut came to power in 1958. Hundreds of, of millions of rands and eventually billions of rands spent on black education in order to equip them for a life on their own away from the white man uh, and living in full autonomy in their own uh, countries, in their own states. And everything that comes with it, their health services, their infrastructure, not only in the earmarked um, states, black states, but also for the blacks who remained in South Africa, which was seen as a temporary measure. They received houses of high quality, they received electricity almost for free, they received health care basically for free, they received infrastructure, roads, police services, postal services, uh, recreational services, social uh, uh, grants, whatever they wanted. And if you, uh, what was the total sum of uh, this money over, over this period of time? Yeah, it's very difficult to, to calculate that because uh, it's not very easy to detect all the monies that went to them. But what I could have ascertained from drawing the national budgets from 1948 till 1994 and what I could see from those budgets and, and what I knew in terms of black spending and, and the naming of the portfolios which went for black spending from 1948 until 1994 comes to almost 2 trillion rand. So it's a lot of money to pay out of your own pocket towards the well-being of other people if you hate them so much. Yeah. as is being alleged. Because uh, what is being portrayed is that uh, those uh, homeland, that they were actually South African citizens, so w why were they needed the passports uh, leaving the territory and the level of self-determination with them? That uh, I, I need to rephrase that question. But uh, the, that people, people that makes the claim that uh, the money went to this black tribe's homeland actually were South African citizens, so it's just oh. money going through within its own sy system to its yeah. own citizens. Yeah. Can you really say that this is a, a contribution to, a, to another country? Well, irrespective of, what, of whether one views it as another country or not, it was definitely a transfer of money from the whites to the blacks. Because this two trillion rand, more or less, which was spent on them, didn't come from their pockets. It came from the pockets of the white taxpayers, mainly, 90% of it, so, uh, or more. So, <coughs> the thing is that whites were bleeding themselves economically dry in an effort to get these people economically and technologically developed. And how strong of a financial powerhouse was South Africa and the Afrikaner community during this time? 
the economy was much stronger than it is now, but on a world scale, one look at a comparatively small economy. Uh, our economy at the best of times in South Africa, even at the height of the gold price, for example, and our gold exports, our economy was smaller than a place like the American state of Wisconsin's economy. So what has to be kept in mind is that we transferred more money from such a small economy, relatively small economy to the blacks, more money than the United Nations pumped into 38 different countries in the Third World War, in the Third World. That was quite amazing. And uh, if we talk uh, demographic, when uh, the border of South Africa that we know since today was uh, in 1910, yeah. how was the demographic difference between uh, the disparity between whites and blacks? Blacks were at that stage around about 21 million of the population and whites were more or less 4 million. And uh, how does those number stand today? Well, the blacks increased, uh, well, they more than doubled. Um, the official version is that they are about 56 million, but I doubt that figure a lot. I think uh, they, they, they much more than that. And uh, why is that? <clears throat> well, the census um, exercises in South Africa from time to time is a complete abortion for a start. They, they're very incomplete and very um, uh, lackluster. The other thing is blacks still, as in during apartheid, uh, flow into South Africa from the northern African territories to a very, in a, at a very large scale. So they come here in order to look for work and in order to have uh, to better their economic circumstances. And uh, yeah, you hear all kinds of strange languages in the in the city centre of Pretoria. You, you hear blacks talking French to each other and Portuguese and whatever. People that just came here from all over. And uh, the white population today. I would estimate the total white population at around about three million, three and a half million. So during uh, apartheid times, the, the white population didn't really grow that much no. from the beginning. And the black population went from 20 millions to yeah. almost 60 million. Yeah, exactly. And uh, pl please help me out. Why, why, how can this be? And uh, you're still being demonized as yeah. uh, as someone that oppressing blacks yeah. if one look at the figures in my book regarding black mortality for example how the massive amounts which were spent on black health services translated into a lower mortality rate um, the um, life expectancy of black uh, babies uh, infant life expectancy how that shot up. Um, it's just amazing. So because they were provided with first world medical services for free. Uh, so their, their population was just uh, exploding, as you say. At the same time, it became so expensive for whites, the living costs, to, to fund apartheid. Because, I mean... Uh, the money, the, the, the trillions spent on the blacks had to come from somewhere. It came from our, from our pockets, from our uh, tax, uh, black, white taxpayers' pockets. So it became so expensive to live that people didn't want to have large families anymore, the whites. Um, company tax, I'm on a correction now, but I think it stood at a stage, uh, at some stage at the, in the region of 50% or more. So, so one could quite literally say that uh, you fed up and nurtured uh, the political enemy you have today. Say again? So, so one could say that uh, you as a white uh, minority population here, and especially during apartheid time, fed up this uh, numerous p 
political enemy that you're facing today in, yeah. in a democracy election. That is exactly what happened. Exactly. And uh, what uh, you go in a little bit in, in your conclusion in this book uh, about the, the, w- the way forward. Uh, how, how do you see it? I, when I wrote the book, I, we still invited now the international community to play a, a, a role in the dispute between the Volksrat and the ANC government by uh, intervening in a mediating capacity. Unfortunately, the international community at large and the individual role players uh, did not see their way open to get involved. We had positive remarks from certain role players in the international community, assuring us that they understand our plight and our problem, but that due to various practical circumstances, they do not see their way open to get directly involved in our case. So in the international community, there exists some actors that just waiting for a window of opportunity to that is possible that is possible because we had some excellent uh, feedback from certain uh, role players in the international community i'm not gonna uh, go much into who said what but the fact is that we picked up clearly that there is a a growing sense of understanding in the international community. And uh, why do you think that is? I think because the ANC uh, drops its mask uh, in uh, in the 24 years, 25 years which they governed. Everything in South Africa uh, went backwards. This whole place became a big star. Anarchy runs rampant. It's just uh, socialist rhetoric uh, and there's a there's a an undeniable trampling on on human rights so and the government claims they can't do anything about it but it's nonsense if you are equipped with governmental powers both uh, well, not only legis- le- in the legislative, but also in the executive and the judiciary. And you have your police and your um, your security forces. There's no reason on earth why you have to have such a murder rate as we have in South Africa. There's no clear-cut desire, in my mind, on the part of the ANC government to govern this country in such a way as to safeguard the rights of law-abiding citizens. They want the second revolution. They want the national democratic revolution, as they call it. And for that, they need instability. They need a, a certain amount of anarchy. And that is the vehicle which they deem by which they are going to usurp the last traces of that what the whites earn, have earned in, in South Africa. And that in my mind is also the monster that is eventually going to devour the ANC itself. The fact that they allow anarchy to such an extent that at, certain, at a certain stage they're not going to be able to contain it any longer. Yeah, because uh, one can very clearly see that they are Marxist and socialist driven. And uh, I cannot help by thinking that uh, all this talk about paying reputation towards the black from apartheid time, that it's it's the simple fact that the white community have been more successful in producing wealth and they want to redistribute that wealth and they're just trying to make... uh, legit claim for for themselves and for others that they themselves own what you built because uh, when i'm driving through through your countryside you have so many open uh, land that is not being farmed yeah and uh, when you're talking about this land land expropriation without compensation 
And lots of this land is actually government owned. Correct. Right? So what, Correct. they could just get the land and build up your own infrastructure. So it seems more like they're actually interesting in what you made with the land rather than the land itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. They, uh, they have expropriated with compensation large tracts of land already, given it over to black farmers or taken it away from the original white owners and whatever they've done with it afterwards all turned into chaos. They've seen that in almost 100% of the cases. And yet still, they intend on taking away from the whites whatever the whites possess in, in this country. And that, again, points back to the fact that what the ANC does in South Africa, just like what the international community did when in the so-called anti-apartheid movement, is not centered around true love towards black people, but it's purely hate against whites. Yeah, I That's mean. what it's about. They want to deprive whites more than they want to give to blacks, because they know giving a black a farm produces nothing. That farm, you can, you can transfer the farm together with the crops on the land, together with the equipment, together with all the infrastructure on the farm, just like it is as a going concern to a black farmer. And it, in, in a year or two, it will be absolutely run into the ground. Yeah, and we also have faucet at hands with uh, Zimbabwe in that regard. Exactly. Yeah. And um, w one problem in this, uh, what you're talking about, that it's an attack against white, is uh, that whites themselves uh, have some kind of guilt towards uh, this uh, so-called historical injustice, so they give it freely. Do, do you see in the near future where, where the white man can reclaim the moral high ground and just say, no, you haven't built this, you doesn't deserve this, this is mine. Yes, I think when it comes to private property rights, the whites have reached a sort of a Rubicon. They have trampled on our rights in terms of education, of having our own language education institutions. They take away our job opportunities at will. They take away our contractual opportunities, our business opportunities by, having, by forcing businesses into the black economic empowerment, so-called route. They make the lives of whites hell in any way they can. But I think when it comes to private property rights, most whites in this country has reached a certain kind of threshold where they just would say this is it we're standing with our backs against the wall and the point of the bayonet is almost piercing our throats already and it's now or never and i think this is where the anc is misjudging the resolve of many whites in this country in their quest not to tolerate any further discrimination against them. And I, I think you're right, uh, not just amongst whites in South Africa, but uh, whites in general in America and Europe as well, that we have a sense of property right and you can't just go to a farm that has been in that family for generations and take it without compensation. Yeah. I, think, I think Europe and America would understand that defensive measure against such, uh, such policies. They might understand it, but I think irrespective of whether the rest of the Western world understand it or not, the fact is that we have reached the bottom of the pit at this stage. We cannot sustain ourselves any longer if even our right to private property is being taken away. 
we sustain ourselves with difficulty already as it is by being discriminated against in the in economic uh, life of South Africa, grossly. So the only thing which people could have done, those who didn't leave, was to try and make it on their own, economically speaking, uh, by farming, by setting up businesses, uh, and by working themselves into a position of economic independence. But if the, even that right is being taken away from you to own, to, to own private property, and we're not talking here about farmland only. The ANC made it quite clear that this expropriation extends to all kinds of property. Ramaphosa the other day even mentioned the money which we've stolen um, according to him, must also be returned, not only la the land. I don't know where he get that from, but anyway. If they do that, if they, if they extinguish your last possible means of sustaining yourself and your family, then I think a, s a material, a substantial number of whites will react in a way completely different to the suppression of the ANC as was customary up until this stage in the white community. Yeah. And uh, I think it's very important to point out, uh, special, especially to you viewers, that uh, with this information out there, no one in the Western world will be able in the future to say that they didn't know what was happening and taking place in, in this country. And uh, with this book uh, of Mr. Kruger, no one can either say that they didn't know the historical past of it. Uh, the, the, the very complex dynamic that this uh, country holds in its uh, luggage. It is very complex. Yeah. Thank you for, very much for having me over here again. <laughs> that is a great pleasure, uh, Jonas, and uh, I sincerely hope we see each other again. Yeah. All right. Thank you.